I wanted to do something a little bit different today. I'm not going to read this from an essay like I have my past post, but I just want to talk to you about something. I've spent a great deal of time in research, almost 62 years now, and my education is as an engineer. Being an engineer, I like to measure things, and believe me, that has carried over into this field as well. Today's topic that I'd like to talk about is footprints, and what can they tell us? Did you know that if you find a Sasquatch footprint, you can find his height and you can find his weight from just that data? How do I know that? Well, I guess it's because I did it. Again, being that engineer, I had to test things, I had to measure things. But first, let's talk a little bit about how they walk versus how we walk. When we walk, we pole vault over our knees. We land with a very heavy heel strike, and then our weight comes down from our heel onto our whole foot. Then, as the off foot swings forward, our weight carries forward, and it starts to pick up, the heel comes up, and there's heavy weight on the ball of the foot. The outcome of this is that the heel is almost always deeper than any other part of the footprint. Now I guess that's kind of natural because that's where the impetus is. With the Sasquatch, they don't walk that way. They use what's called a compliant gait. And in the compliant gait, when their foot comes up, it swings out, around, and comes down directly in front of the following foot. It comes down flat so that when they move forward, when the off foot comes off the ground, their entire weight is on that foot, flat on the ground. As they continue forward, they have a device in their foot called a mid-tarsal break. They're not unique in this. A lot of primates have this. We don't, but many other primates do. As they continue forward, that mid-tarsal break does its thing. It breaks. And now their entire weight is on the front half of the foot alone. Therefore, if you want to tell a real Sasquatch track from a created Sasquatch track, you only have to look at a couple of things. Number one, the toes. Their toes have never seen shoes. Ours have. Their toes are long, they're unencumbered, and they look almost like fingers on their feet. That's not true with us. Our toes are cramped. They're boxy. They're short. Why? Because they're bottled up inside of socks and shoes for 67% of our life. That's a big thing to look for. Also, if that mid-tarsal break is present, if you can see it, that can be faked. It could be a hoaxed track, but I guarantee you it is not human. Also, if you find a track that does not have claw marks in front of it, it's not a bear. Bears do not have retractable claws. Their claws are permanently fixed. Therefore, when they step, when they leave a track, they will also leave their claw marks. Very easy to identify a bear's track. Therefore, the problem some people have with misidentifying Sasquatch tracks from double-struck bear prints where the hind foot of the bear steps into the front foot of the bear are simply not looking at the facts. In that case, there will be tracks. There will be claw marks at the front of the track. There will be claw marks in the middle of the track from that back foot. Look for that. Now, let's get into the measurement of tracks. I told you some strange things. 
I told you that if you give me the length of their track, I can tell you how tall he was and how much he weighed. Now, I know this does not sound intuitive, but let's talk about that a moment. I started finding tracks back in the early 70s, and I started measuring them. Being an engineer, that's pretty normal. Once I had the length, I needed to know more. I learned about the anatomical constant as taught in anatomy class for all primates, wherein a primate's height is 6.5 times the length of his foot. Therefore, if his foot is 10 inches long, he is 65 inches high. It's as simple as that. If his foot is 20 inches long, then he's 130 inches high. That's pretty high, by the way. The next thing I wanted to know is how much weight it took to sink that deeply into the soil, since I certainly didn't. And this one really came home to roost back in the early 70s when I was on an outing. I was working as a forester out on the Olympic Peninsula, and I came around a big root wad, and there standing at a huckleberry bush eating huckleberries was a very large Sasquatch. He walked away and left a beautiful trackway one that I had no problem identifying just simply because I'd watched him make it. There's hardly any better proof than that, I think. Well, I got the idea to measure this. So I took off my own boots and I walked beside him. Since it was exactly the same time, I didn't have to worry about whether the soil was drier now or wetter now or any other of a myriad of factors that could change how firm that soil was. It was identical to when he walked there a few minutes before. What I found right away, of course, was that I didn't sink in near as far as he did. And I thought that was probably a factor of weight. I knew it was a factor of weight, actually. But I didn't really understand why at the time. So I started thinking about it. And I got the idea to measure the square inches of my foot that was on the ground versus the square inches of foot of him that was on the ground. The difference was graphic. I placed 34.5 square inches of myself on the ground when I had one foot firmly in place. His was almost 80 square inches. That's a huge difference. I guesstimated his weight, and at that time I was buying cattle a lot at auction, and I could estimate the weight of a steer in the auction ring to within 20-25 pounds without any trouble, and I estimated his weight to be somewhere right around 600 pounds. At least I figured that was close enough for government work. It was, it was within the ballpark, in the pickle barrel, so to speak. So what I did is I used that and I figured out roughly the area of his foot and I divided his weight by that area and I came up with a figure of around seven, a little better than seven pounds per square inch pressure he was putting on the ground. Well, I did the same thing with mine, knowing my weight, and I was only at like four and a half pounds per square inch pressure. No wonder he was sinking deeper than I was. He was putting more pounds per square inch pressure on the ground. Subsequent to that, I wanted to get more accurate. So what I did is I built a device. It was a, basically a big box with one foot. And I could change that foot. I kept a tube of six in my truck. And when I came on a track, I would cut a piece of that tube of six off that had the same area as that track. And in order to measure that track, I used a device called a planimeter. A planimeter is an engineer's device that is designed to measure irregular areas. Now I could be much more accurate in determining the area of that foot. And that's 10 square inches. So what you do is if I want to measure this weird amoeba shape, just looking at it, it looks like it's maybe probably one and a half to two. I'll put this little gizmo on some starting point and I'll go over here and set this to zero again. And then you trace around here, kind of like going around a little track. I'm going to go pretty quick here, just so it's not too boring. But you run around, try not to run off track very much. You can always go multiple loops. 
There it is. It's about 1.9 square inches. And you can go around many times and average it out. I would then take that board, make the same area, same square, square inches of area, put that foot on the bottom of my box, and you'll see the picture above that uh, shows you what I was talking about here. The two extended arms were just so I could nail it to a tree so it w would stand up and wouldn't fall over on me. Then I loaded it with sandbags that I had filled with rock and sand, uh, 50 pounds each, about. I weighed them, I had, you know, I, this was terribly accurate, I had a bathroom scale I carried in the truck and I'd weigh them out to about, you know, an average of 50 pounds each. And then I'd load those onto that box until it sunk as deep as the footprint had. Now, you gotta remember, be very careful here, we're only now looking at the back half of that footprint because that was made when his entire foot was on the ground. Remember, the front half sunk deeper when he stepped forward because the weight came off the back half and was all on the front half. So we only use the back half for determining this weight. Now, once I did that, I knew the height of the individual and I knew his weight. But could I reduce that to a mathematical problem since I was really getting rather tired of filling and toting sandbags all around the country? Wasn't there a way to come up with that? As it turned out, yes, it was entirely possible. As we know, the area of a figure is a simple function of the length times the width. So if we knew the average width of a foot, we could just multiply that times the length, which we already had, as we measured that to determine the area. It turns out, since we had the area and length already, the problem was simple, as the width is equal to the area divided by the length. That's just a transposition of that formula. In all of them I had done, it turned out that the width, thus calculated, was four-tenths of the length. Further, by the use of my weight machine, I found that the ground pressure could be found by dividing the weight as found by the box by the area of the foot on the ground. Again, this provided another constant of 7.5 pounds per square inch of ground pressure. Now we had the constants we needed, and all I needed to do on finding the print was to plug them in. Now let's take a look at a 15 inch track and run the numbers on it, shall we? In primates, height is 6.5 times foot length. So for a 15 inch track, height equals 15 times 6.5 or 97.5, which is an inch and a half over 8 feet. The average foot width is 40% of its length, therefore its area is the width times the length, so it would be 15 times 0.4, which gives us the width, times 15, the length, or 90 square inches. That's the area of foot on the ground. The weight is 7.5 psi times the area. So the weight is 90 times 7.5, or 675 pounds. That makes this individual 8 foot tall, and he weighs 675 pounds. All of that comes just simply from knowing the track was 15 inches in length. Now, does this mean that every track that you find is going to fit this exact same criteria? No. Just like us, they vary. What it is going to do is going to put it in the center of the belt curve, and then you will have your standard deviations from center. One standard deviation taking in 68% of the population, two 95%, and third standard deviation will cover 99%, and all else being that 1% fringe. That's tracks, and that's what you can learn from tracks. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions about this. It's not complicated, but it is mathematics. So if you have any misunderstandings or would like to know more, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, and let me know how you like this method, how you like this conversational presentation rather than a written formal essay. And if you would, would you please hit that like button down there and feel free to subscribe if you would, that would be helpful to me. 
It helps my ego to know that people are liking what I do. Thank you very much.